Thank you, Dan. So, good evening and welcome as the World Affairs Council of Houston presents Robert Mosmacher, uh, United States versus China, dominating business in the developing world. My name is Sandy Bayou. I'm the Chief Development Officer here at the Council. My pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of this wonderful organization. And how wonderful to see you all at a sold out event. So, another sold out event. And a success, Mr. Mosmacher. Thank you for that. Uh, a couple of programming notes, you know, we always offer some opportunities for us to know where we have programming coming up next week. Uh, we are hosting Laura Murphy on the Freedom Bill, the 21st Century Slave Revolt on the Realities of Contemporary Forced Labor. We have two programs, one in Woodlands and uh, here in United Way on Wednesday. Thursday, another timely dialogue featuring Ambassador Vicky of Venezuela, that is Thursday, following, uh, on following week, uh, we have discussion on conflict on Ethiopia, so another region, part of the world that we haven't spoken about so much lately. Uh, and then afterwards, conversation with Ambassador Bill Taylor, former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine. He will be joining us uh, March 22nd at Royal Sinister, right across the street. Uh, note to yourself, there will be a networking opportunity before the event. So come early, we expect the program probably will be sold out Royal Sinister. That is March 22nd. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? What did I say? Sorry, 24. Thank you, Ronan. Um, Global Affairs, the uh, Foreign Policy Institute, is something that Ronan helps us uh, oversee. It is a way for one to join and uh, increase their knowledge in global affairs. We have programs starting relatively soon, so reach out to make sure that you secure that seat. That will start in April, evening sessions on Tuesdays. Traveling with Council, some of you have traveled with me, some of you have traveled with the Council. We are still traveling, and we've traveled already once, and we still have some fantastic lineup for the rest of the year. Places such as Iceland, Mongolia, Morocco, France. Um, we're doing also exclusive back to Washington, D.C. trip as well later in the year. So all of this and much, much more on our website, wachouston.org. Tonight, as you might have noticed right behind you, uh, please stay and network with it. We have some wine that's already being filled and red wine that's already being aerated. So please stay behind to network and say hello to the guests and ask some more questions. And before our program, we kick off, I'm going to join I'm one sort of the new members, so I'm going to do a little bit of trivia. As we know, we both some, uh, have hosted many wonderful speakers. I'm one sort of our new members. So. Five questions, five winners. The first one says, with the book, and one of them gives it up to you. <laughs> How many Student World Affairs Councils do we currently have, which we call them SWACs? Point six. <laughs> yeah. Point six. More? 52. 54. Good job. That's all yours. I just wanted to say it's really fantastic to have 54 student world affairs councils established in the Greater Houston area in 17 independent school districts. Good job. Next one. What does OPIC stand for? OPIC. Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That's all we're number two. OPIC stands for Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Uh, mentioning about travel, what is the next trip or next destination that's taking place? Where are we going after Egypt? Say, nope. Iceland. 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 No, I think the lady right, said. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, the lady lecture. Iceland. In recent years, uh, who supplies the greater dollar value of global development finance flow? Is it the World Bank, IMF, US, or China? John China. China. That's, That's right, the gentleman right there. We'll be right back with you. Alright, it's almost gotta go all the way back to the German in the next row. And the last one. What is the name of the act passed in Congress to establish the FDC, also known as the US International Development Finance Corporation? What is the name of this act? That's right. The Bill Act. Yeah, Bernard. Bernard, good job. Wonderful. <laughs> Council's board member, TJ Raguso, who is actually from MG Bank uh, here, is will have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. And just a couple of sentences about TJ and his accomplishment. 
Uh, PJ joined Energy Bank, Energy Bank more than 27 years ago. Uh, experience in trade finance, letters of credit, uh, accident bank lending, commercial lending, foreign exchange, and so, so much more. TJ, thank you for hosting us. Good to have you. If you would join me, please, in introducing the speaker. And while you're coming up, don't forget to pick up these handy dandy calendars. Thank you again. TJ. Thank you. Um, it's good to have you guys here. As uh, Sanjay alluded to, I've been here all day. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see, this is a very prepared crowd um, for tonight. Um, but most importantly, I'm happy to welcome you to an in-person event. Is anybody tired of Zoom calls or Teams? I certainly am. Um, tonight's topic of U.S. versus China, uh, dominating business and development in the world. Anytime we've got the topic, including U.S. versus China, we know there's going to be a lot to unpack. And uh, Robert Mossbacher Jr.'s experience and background are ideal for this discussion on how we'll counter China's investment uh, efforts in the developing world. Uh, I think most importantly for us here in Houston is that uh, Robert Mossbacher knows the energy business, having acted as chief executive officer, chairman, and director of multiple energy companies. And on the subject of development finance, his tenure as CEO of OPEC gave him a front row seat to not only what we as a, at the United States has in our arsenal to support um, you know, foreign direct investment abroad, but also what the global playing field is and what our competitors are doing. Um, his success at OPEC prepared him to take a leadership role to really draft and lead the passage of the BUILD Act, which was mentioned earlier, um, in 2018, which actually combined the former OPIC and the agency of USAID to create the Development Finance Corporation. While not specifically mentioned in his bio, his success and his tenure in Washington most certainly qualified him as a diplomat, and we're really happy to have him with us tonight to share his perspectives. So please join me in welcoming Robert Mossbacher, Jr. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, TJ, and, and for all of you who may not know TJ, he has been one of our uh, foremost and most active and most supportive board members for many years, and uh, if you're wondering how we're able to be in such a beautiful space, you can thank TJ and everyone at Energy Bank. So thank you, TJ, for all you've done. And, and, and Rob, uh, so say we're delighted to have you back in Houston. Um, you're one of those speakers I love bringing back because Houston loves you and our audience loves you. Um, for any of you who may know Rob uh, to a degree, his bio is only part of it. The, the amount that he's done in Houston directly is incredible for various charity boards, for GHP, for everything. So thank you for all you've done for Houston and in the United States. Um, and just for the audience tonight, I'm just going to open it up because obviously it's it's hard to ignore the tragic and despicable news coming out of Ukraine. We're just going to have the, a broad, very you know, thirty thousand foot overview of, of what's going on now with, with Ukraine and Russia and sanctions. Um, but please keep in mind, uh, Rob is an energy executive. He is an expert on, on global finance and development finance. He is not a sanctions expert. He, he's not a Russian expert. So we'll just that, that will become apparent in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss that for a bit, and then I want to move on to really the heart of what we're talking about tonight, which is uh, the goal of U.S. development finance. Uh, the incredible work Rob was the driving force behind passing of the, the Build Act. Uh, but just to, to open it up, um, <clears throat> increasingly in the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, sanctions for the United States and our allies have become a more common foreign policy tool and hopefully a way of influencing and, and you know, directing um, either positive or negative uh, uh, policy by another country, you know, whether it's the soft beneficial power of something like OPIC and then and, uh, and later DFC. But just in the broadest sense, can you talk about the difficulty and perhaps the pleasant surprise of being able to get the Europeans all to come together, but the difficulty of imposing sanctions when if you do not have many of the world's major economic powers on board, um, it might all be relatively you know, kind of inconsequential. Yeah, Ronan, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here and see so many friends. And uh, I've talked to some of my family into showing up. I'm grateful to them as well. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm not an expert on sanctions, but I would say having observed them in multiple uh, different iterations, uh, more often than not, sanctions are of limited effect, except when they are as sweeping and as comprehensive and as targeted uh, as these sanctions are. So among the many, I wouldn't say benefit, but at least pleasant outcomes, surprising outcomes from this uh, horrific invasion, one is that uh, the sanctions that have been agreed to by NATO and by the European community and by the world uh, are extraordinary. And, uh, you know, will they uh, deter uh, Putin from pursuing his naked aggression? I doubt it. Uh, but it will place pressure on him, directly on him, as well as directly on many of his closest associates and protectors, the oligarchs, uh, and it may even create uh, an economic collapse in Russia of such size and impact uh, that it could lead to unprecedented domestic turmoil for him to deal with. And so, uh, among the several miscalculations that Putin made, the first being that Zelensky and the whole government would fold uh, at the sight of uh, Russian troops on their border, another was uh, his concern about NATO encroaching more and more from the West uh, on Russian uh, designs and Russian integrity, uh, and yet he's done exactly the opposite of what he wanted to do. He's united NATO like never before, and he has created the format uh, for sanctions that are sweeping as we've ever seen. And I don't need to <clears throat> mention other places where we've applied sanctions, but, but once again, you can go back to the sanctions that were applied in 2014 after the Russians took Crimea. You can look at the sanctions that were imposed on the Iranians. Had some impact, but never leading to actual change in government. Uh, we've had sanctions on Venezuela, which unfortunately has done nothing more than enrich the small group around Maduro. Uh, so they are not the best tool around. They're, however, about the only tool if you don't want to get involved in a in a, a, a battle face-to-face -face, uh, with whatever aggression you're trying to stop. So um, I say that uh, I'm very optimistic that these sanctions are going to create significant dislocation, hurt, and uh, hope and pray that it may change uh, the trajectory that Putin's on, but I'm not terribly confident of that. And you mentioned a you know, pleasant surprise of, of all the Europeans getting on board quickly, NATO members, non-NATO members, um, even the Germans, um, reticent for years. For yeah, let me just say something. This is, I mean, so many of you have watched this forever, but this is literally five decades since the Germans have actually gone from uh, a nation in which they were willing to, of course, be an integral part of NATO, but always keep the door open to the Soviet Union or to Russia uh, to a point now where they have actually uh, not just overcome their previous uh, commitment to basically a pacifist approach and not paying even their fair share of NATO to now supplying weapons uh, to the Ukrainian army, as well as the Swiss, uh, as well as, as uh, the Finns who are looking at uh, perhaps petitioning to be part of NATO. So Putin's done a lot to really kind of uh, mobilize uh, folks to head in the right direction. This is a sad and tragic situation that he's created, but at least uh, he is sort of drawing a clear line uh, between those who favor freedom and those who don't. And, you know, despite the fact geographically, obviously, Russia is dramatically larger than other, any other country in the world. It's 140, 150 million people, but, but relatively speaking, a small economy. But it's an economy that's important for Europe. Uh, from the United States perspective, perhaps it's easier for us to impose and accept sanctions. Our volume of trade with Russia is tiny. It's comparable to what we trade with Peru, what we trade with the Philippines. It's well less than 1% of our total imports and exports per year. But for the Europeans, it's a very, very different question. Are you surprised that they're willing to accept what is coming, the large financial you know, pain from potential restrictions on Russian gas, potential restrictions on oil, cutting off Nord Stream 2? 
Yeah, I mean, that's uh, who knows how people will feel six months from now if we're still in the middle of this. Uh, but I think there's every reason to believe that the Europeans will stay together. I think part of it will be because if this goes on for uh, six months, that probably means that Russian troops uh, are in Kiev and that there's an insurgency underway. And that the Ukrainians, who are incredibly courageous, uh, and, you know, as one who has been involved in politics and government most of my life, uh, it's rare that you see someone fight so courageously to defend freedom and democracy. And they are in the face of overwhelming odds. And it's just very heartwarming to see. Um, but, you know, yeah, you can make the argument that five or six months from now, that uh, folks will start to flake. In other words, the economic pressure will be such that uh, they decide uh, we, we no longer deserve. I, I'm actually optimistic they'll stay together because I think the further we get into this, the more killing there is, the more apparent it is that you know, this is all about Putin's dreams uh, and, and uh, his desire to rebuild the empire, if you will, uh, the more resigned people will be to we have to fight this and stay with it. And besides your obvious many years in Washington, and you're still a, a major uh, force, uh, like I say, it influenced the, the dramatically the passage of the Build Act. You have a, you know, many, many decades in the energy industry. We, we talked about national governments making decisions. Are you surprised at how relatively quickly, in a matter of days, major, you know, international oil and gas companies, BP, Shell, Exxon, have all decided they're willing to write off billions of dollars of projects in Russia, um, and perhaps is some of that because at least with high oil prices, they feel they can kind of counterbalance those losses for this year with relatively high revenues. Are you, does it surprise you? Well, you know, you'd like to think they'd be willing to write off $25 billion losses in a $100, I mean, in something other than a $100 barrel of farm. Uh, and I think they would. I mean, I, I think you just get to the point where it's just untenable to be doing business uh, with Russian companies, and particularly that have such a state uh, ownership imprint like much of the energy industry does. So uh, I'm encouraged that they've done this. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and I think they would have done it even if we were getting $50 per hour. That's good. Um, and just to, to, so again, like I said, you are not a sanctions expert, but you're a finance expert. Um, maybe can you help people understand just maybe not all of the, what we hear about the terms of sanctions, but maybe two of the bigger ones that maybe have more impact. Um, can you talk about what it means um, when the United States decided it will prohibit Americans from doing business with the Russian Central Bank? Well, I think that's, you know, that and Nord Stream 2 were the two biggest developments that uh, will hurt, um, I think, Putin and Russia. Nord Stream, I think he was counting on the Germans basically sticking with him and agreeing to, to finalize the project. Uh, so that was not only a surprise to him, but I think it was a wonderful uh, development for the West. Um, and then, yes, I mean, we, we heard about the $640 billion or whatever it was, a rainy day fund that, uh, that had apparently been swirled away by, by Putin uh, to kind of provide a, a, a sort of insulation from uh, the sanctions, and, and it would be available to be used. But the fact that we can limit access to that through the central bank to hard currency is another area where I think uh, you're really hurting them in a way that is felt not just by Putin and the oligarchs, but more broadly by the entire country. And then another headline that might have got a lot of people's attention, but maybe they're not familiar with what it actually means or the realities of it kind of at an at a actual banking level. Can you talk about the restrictions um, uh, restricting of certain Russian banks being, able, banks being allowed to access SWIFT and, and what SWIFT actually is and, and what it means. <laughs> you're really testing my knowledge. <laughs> I, I think it's just, you know, you're getting into the ease, relative electronic ease of doing businesses and transactions that, you know, when you take away uh, the high-speed availability of instantaneous transfers of things uh, and all of a sudden construct impediments, uh, it hurts. And so I think it has a huge impact on the volume of business, the ease of business, and whether or not you want to do business with somebody who had been kicked out of SWIFT. I should ask TJ to talk about this, because I know that Amogee right here, you're, you're dealing with issues of, 
of uh, what can go through, what has to be blocked, and so forth. Um, and then just to kind of you know segue to, to where you know, the heart of what we'll talk about tonight, can you talk about your overall impressions of the changes of the economic relationship between Russia and China? Um, obviously, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, you know, it was quote unquote Russia was the big brother overlooking China. Obviously, that script is completely flipped. Uh, the Russians don't want to accept it, but China is obviously the massive economic power. Can you talk about that relationship? Yeah, that's, I mean, <clears throat> um, the Chinese uh, relationship with Russia is a marriage of convenience of the first order. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is going on in terms of China's approach to international development and how they have uh, been about a very, very uh, impressive effort to uh, curry favor or win hearts and minds uh, in developing countries around the world. Uh, and part of that is because they have these huge reserves built up. And part of it is because they have uh, labor uh, that they'd like to deploy elsewhere, in other words, workers and, and folks. But they also are about trying to uh, win a battle of whose system is better. Not just whose economic model is better, but whose system is better. And, you know, even though I think none of us in this room would think there was even a close call between, you know, an autocratic system uh, and, a, and a liberal democracy like ours, nevertheless, they get things done, and they get them done faster. And, you know, we don't, they don't spend weeks and months relitigating things. So, you know, there are some advantages uh, that they would claim, and, uh, and the, the area where they find common ground with the Russians is uh, the whole question of whose system is better, an autocratic system or a democratic system. And there aren't that many autocrats that are worth being in bed with. Uh, and so the Russians and the Chinese are in bed together. Uh, although I have to say, I think they're extraordinarily uncomfortable with the invasion because one of the few principles you hear articulated by the Chinese constantly is territorial integrity and not uh, not invading uh, the, uh, the boundaries of, of uh, sovereign nations. And, uh, and yet, that's exactly what Putin did. So they don't want to look like they're sympathetic to that or supporting to that. Supportive of that, I think what they've said is their, their understanding of Russia's feeling imposed upon by the eastward expansion of NATO. Uh, and so they understand that, but they don't really like what he's up to. And I would say, given how strongly Americans, and frankly, most freedom-loving people in the world have reacted overnight to naked aggression in Ukraine, would be, or should be, a warning signal to the Chinese that even though Taiwan is not a sovereign nation in their eyes, and in the eyes of many others, it is nevertheless a democracy that has prospered on its own, and if they were thinking about trying to swallow Taiwan, uh, they might find they had sort of stirred up a hornet's nest that uh, wasn't worth it. Excellent point. Um, you know, over the last 10, 20 years, the Chinese <coughs> have you know, spent and or loaned hundreds of billions of dollars all around the world, especially the developing world. Um, you know, the, the influence of that is political, it's access to minerals, it's you know, access to markets. You know, the Belt and Road Initiative, people say by the time it's finished 10, 20 years, it might have been a trillion dollar project. Um, it's a term we talk about here, it's in, you know, it's in the title of what we're saying, but can you tell people what exactly you mean by development finance and why it's important to the United States and our allies, our democratic allies, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Europeans? So when you, when you think of the kind of tools, diplomatic tools, or tools we have to engage with the rest of the world. Not so much the upper middle income or upper income countries, where we have a lot of common heritage or culture or what have you. I'm speaking primarily about Europe or, or in certain parts of the Far East. Um, engaging with countries in terms of, uh, particularly developing countries, uh, in a way that uh, enables their economic growth and development uh, is and has been one of our highest priorities. Well, you know, after World War II, what we embarked upon in the United States was essentially official development assistance, or foreign aid. And foreign aid has a role, and foreign aid is paid for and has saved, I mean, not millions, billions 
of lives from disease and starvation and what have you. But it's not generally the most effective way to help grow an economy. That's the way you help grow an economy is to help create and encourage private sector uh, investment and market competition and all the things that we have in this country we take for granted. Uh, so development finance is, is how you facilitate investment in countries that don't have the stable sort of rule of law or institutions that we do in the West. So if I wanted to build a power plant in Ghana, for instance, um, I might, and, and I've done all the research to show that they needed the power and that uh, you know, we, could, we could find the fuel source for it and all that. If I went to a bank, even an energy bank, and said, would you finance this project? They would probably say, no, way too risky. And so was that, would that be the end of the story? No, you could come actually to what used to be called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which I headed for three and a half years. Uh, it's now called the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. And you could say to us, would you finance our project? And the answer would be, assuming all things were equal, yes. And so uh, we have a development finance institution in Washington, and there are over 30 of them around the world. All the European countries have the same thing. This is all about enabling or facilitating investment in high-risk places. And to, you not only enable the investment, but then you mitigate the risk. So. If I invested in, just to use the example of the power project in Ghana, if I invested in that project, I build the project, and all of a sudden the government decides, well, let's take it from them. Expropriate, in other words, take it away from us. Uh, you know, if I had bought political risk insurance, or if I had, had teamed up with the Development Finance Institution, um, and things started to look like they were going off the rail, I could go to the agency and say, you know, these guys are about to steal our project. Well, so in my role as head of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, I would go connect with my counterparties in the Ghanaian government. And I'd say, this is really a bad idea what you're about to do. And by the way, if you do it, there are going to be real consequences. Uh, we have leverage. And so that's how development finance institutions sort of try to level the playing field, sort of try to take the worst out of of the inclination for corruption and rent seeking, we call it, and try to enable economic growth in high risk places. And with that growth, you help to encourage, you hope to encourage, establishment of the rule of law and institutions where you can have a contract that's predictable and enforceable. So that's what development finance institutions do. Now, the Chinese, going back to 2013, uh, came upon an idea of a way to, expect, to spend much of the reserves they had accumulated as a state owning everything, um, and to hopefully make friends and influence people around the world by going to middle and lower income countries that were absolutely desperate for somebody to help underwrite a road from a, from a farm to a market or to build a, a bridge or to build a power plant. And they go in and say, we'll finance that project for you. And the government would uh, say, well, really? And, and so, yeah, we'll finance the project for you. What they did say was, we're going to finance this project for you, and it's really going to cost you. But you don't have any other choice. And that's, in essence, the way they've operated. So China, very smartly, has taken advantage of the fact that many of the countries like the United States that engage primarily internationally through foreign assistance, through foreign aid, well, that started to sort of peak, and it even started to decline, and there was no act two with the private sector stepping up and saying, but we'll fill that void. And so the Chinese have had the field to themselves. And I have to say, I have never, ever met uh, an official of particularly governments that I've talked to in sub-Saharan Africa that said, boy, we'd really rather do business with the Chinese than the Americans. No, they'd say, we would love to do business with Americans. We'd much rather do business with Americans. You guys are nowhere to be found. And this has gone on like this for 15 years or so. So, the Chinese using that model very wisely have established a presence in markets all over the world. Let me give you an example of some of the things they've done. They own 
either controlling interest or uh, a significant interest in over 70 ports in over 30 countries around the world. Now, they're not just doing that because the port business is that good. Is that right, Mark? It's not that good. Um, <laughs> but no, they're doing it because uh, you know these are projects that can be converted to Chinese uh, Blue Navy aspirations later on. So this is what's been going on, and uh, and so we, the United States and the West, I think, have to decide. You know, what are we going to do to try to counter this? And let me just say a word about the nature of the projects. It's overwhelmingly infrastructure. The terms are generally strong in the sense that they don't actually, there's a term we use called conditionality. They don't use policy conditionality. In other words, when they lend you, lend you money to finance a project, they don't say, and we want you to vote with us at the UN. No, they say, if you default on this project, we want this project collateralized by some other economic asset like access to certain minerals, or access to uh, you know, some, some, something of, of, of value. So that's the way they operate. They create these sort of conditional uh, commitments for people, and, then, and, and the terms tend to be fairly light on the, in the beginning, so the country can you know, kind of swallow it, and then they're hooked. And what happens is many of these countries struggle to meet the terms. So there have been a number of these projects that have had to be uh, redone. Uh, some heads of state have said, just let us off the hook. We didn't want this kind of indebtedness. Others have figured out a way to make it happen. Others have had to default and have given up uh, the project they have. And you know, one of the ones that gets quoted all the time or cited all the time is a, a poor project in Sri Lanka where you know, the, the government defaulted. The Chinese came in and took over the port facility. They took over 99 acres around the port facility, and they have that in perpetuity. So, this is what's going on, and this is what we are challenged to counter. And so, that's what, uh, that's a long way to No, it was perfect. It was excellent. And uh, that's what the, the Build Act is all about, and the establishment of the U.S. Uh, International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC, if, if you hear people referring to the short, uh, shortened acronym for it. Um, you mentioned some of the, the, the downsides to it. Uh, you know, and it can prevent these, uh, sorry, it can, it can present possible debt traps, things that might not be obvious at first. But can you talk about, you know, earlier we talked about this is more than just an economic model. In terms of a political model, not communism versus democracy light in, in Russia, but in terms of an authoritarian model, it's a political model that's attractive to some developing countries where they have strong man leader to say, hey, look at the Chinese model, the Russian model. We just plow through to do what we want to do. We'll be okay. Can you talk about why it is some of these loans are so attractive in the first place, uh, especially in terms of the fact that they might not have some of like the market reforms or labor reforms that might be required by a loan from the IMF or the World Bank of the United States? Um, and and why it is they would proceed with these in the first place, or is it that their own congresses don't know exactly what's going on, and it's just a few key people making decisions that might you know burden the country for the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, so it's not only that the Chinese may be the only game in town, in which case you know you may accept their offer, even though the terms aren't quite what you'd like. It's also because the Chinese don't ask you to change anything. What do I mean by that? I mean, when the United States comes in and finances something or commits to a major grant program, we want to move that country towards more freedom, more democracy, more civil liberties, more economic freedom, and that's what we push them to do. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we aren't, but we always want to encourage them to move closer, particularly uh, if they tend to be uh, a fairly closed society. Chinese don't do that. Not only do they not want to have that kind of system, but you know they pride themselves. In fact, Xi Jinping has stood up at the five-year anniversary after he launched the uh, Belt and Road strategy. And Belt and Road, by the way, is the term that came from the Chinese recreating the old silk uh, trade routes that uh, went primarily from China westward. Uh, but this is their contemporary version of that. 
And so they call it the belt and road, or one belt, one road strategy. But anyway, now, you know, they not only don't, I mean, Xi Jinping stood up and said, unlike the West, our model does not involve requiring you to change things. We don't push you to do things. So, I mean, I'm not sure I'd admit that, but they seem to be proud of it. And not only do they not ask you to change things, but in many cases, they'll sell you the best surveillance equipment they have in their arsenal. I'm serious. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, well, you're repressing, you have your foot on the neck of these people. Here, let us give you a better tool to do that with. I mean, seriously. So that some of that's going on. And so they, they are unconditional in terms of of their expectations of people changing uh, their systems to be more freedom-focused. Um, to quote uh, uh, you know, John Adams, the second president of the United States, I think he said, there, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by force and one is by debt. Um, when you look at you know, these potentially restrictive and damaging loan programs, if it's you know, a country in Africa, a country in, in Latin America, you maybe have a change of administration and they look at the terms and say, what in the world, we didn't sign up for this, we, we, we can't pay this five, ten years from now. What have been the ramifications for that and, and um, do you think you see any changes in that? So different countries have handled that differently. If some of them have gone into very difficult debt situations, uh, you know, some have uh, gone to, to Beijing and, and worked with the Chinese on trying to you know, kind of redo the deal. Um, some have, have screamed about it and have pointed out that, that, that uh, you know, they didn't fully understand the terms or that you know, the predecessor group that was paid off by the, uh, whomever uh, had made these deals. And here's another you know, unfortunate aspect of many of the deals that China makes is they don't generally like transparency. So, you know, they're not very interested in having an open competitive bid. More recently, they've become even more sophisticated about this because, uh, let me just finish that first sentence. So, so they like negotiated deals. They like deals that are done as much as possible in the dark, which means that you can't see who got paid off, but trust me, uh, a lot of these deals involve people getting paid off. Uh, and so, you know, they resist the kind of open, transparent competition that we like. So, again, the U.S. and the West and the World Bank and a whole bunch of other development finance institutions, we all bring these kind of set of rules that we like for people to play by. Now, fast forward, so the Chinese are not able to negotiate certain deals in certain places, and they know they have to participate in a competitive bid. Well, now they've gotten very, very clever they come in at the low bid. I mean, in fact, I've had Bactel tell me, uh, you know, we can't win a bid against these guys. They always come in and undercut us. But the difference is, Chinese know how to claw back into a profitable situation. This is the pattern. They know how to find enough ambiguity uh, in the agreement, or they have just sort of much, as much leverage as they need to turn it into a more profitable deal than it was by virtue of the bid they put in, which may have been the low bid. So. And, and one more step that's taken, there are places where they're not going to win a bid because there's a resistance uh, to their approach. And yet, you know, they may have qualified as a bidder, but now what they've done, and they've done this in certain Latin American countries, they go in and buy the equity, 56 to 100% of the equity of a local partner that's going to win the bid. So, very clever, very smart, and with lots of money. And one other thing that, that, you know, we're challenged to do is, and this is real, a real asset of the Chinese, when they sign a deal, they're off the races. There's nothing conditioned upon, or, you know, you don't have to subject to. We sign deals subject to, and it may be six months, it may be a year. Meanwhile, the Chinese are off the races, and that's a real disadvantage for us. Um, and, and getting to the heart of, of DFC, excuse me, and the, the Build Act, which you were driving force when it passed, one of the rare, you know, strongly passed by bipartisan, uh, you know, uh, success stories in Congress in the last few years. A lot of great Democrats and Republicans uh, voted for it equally. Um, 
Can you tell people what is kind of at the core, the core tenets of the Build Act and what it means for DFC? And um, I would say one thing probably make a lot of people happy here, something that was true for OPIC, but all the years we were present there, um, it's all done at no net cost to the American taxpayer. Yeah. So one of the main reasons why I finished serving in the Bush administration and decided to stay in Washington after having spent three and a half years as head of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation was that I felt like our development capacity, our economic diplomacy toolkit, was badly out of date. We were getting out of hustle. And this is before China turned it on as much as they have. I mean, this was like 2008, 2009 that I was done. So I wanted to stay up there in Washington to help work on creating a much stronger development finance capability that could truly compete around the world. Well, there were certain tools that the OPEC had when I was there that hadn't been upgraded since 1971. And so today, what the Development Finance Institution does is it can finance projects that banks won't finance, kind of like the Ghanaian project I told you about. Uh, and it could sell you political risk insurance. So if a country expropriated a project from you, took your project away from you, you could buy insurance that would cover the cost of your loss. Uh, and then it helped create private equity funds, but it was always doing so in the form of debt. So what we, all of us who were working on this, wanted to do was to create a 21st century development finance institution that could do several things that OPIC couldn't do. One, invest equity in projects. Every other development finance institution in the world, I think, can put equity in projects. And equity is really critical because these are projects in poor places. To loan somebody some money to get that project off the ground will help them, but if they're so cash strapped that you know they don't have enough cash to do the thing, I mean to live month to month, they need equity, and we couldn't give them equity. So equity was in the Build Act. Second, we wanted small grant authority or technical assistance. In other words, you know, again, the Ghanaian Power Project, you say, well, that ought to be done in three to five years. No, it took five to seven years. And so you run out of money. Lots of developers run out of money. And yet they're perfectly viable projects. And that lots of, you know, lots of business people run out of money run on working on projects. And so we can now provide the last piece to get you from the five yard line across the goal line so your project is bankable. So that's very relevant. Third, we can only do projects in dollars. And even though we'd always rather do projects in dollars, there's some projects, if you don't do them in local currency, they don't get done. Uh, and so that was another authority we wanted. Uh, and then fourth, we always had a quarter of the project had to be owned by an American. Totally understandable. This is American taxpayer money being used. Totally understandable. But there are projects where there's no American that wants to participate. I spent three years going in and out of Afghanistan trying to get a small and medium-sized bank set up because that's what the Afghan economy was all about. And I had uh, Afghans and some people from the Gulf who were prepared to put in money. I could never find an American to put in 25%. Well, now, under the new Build Act, uh, we can, if there's no American money available, I mean, no American wants to be in the project, we can go forward anyway. Uh, and so that's a third. And fourth was we used to have a ceiling of roughly thirty billion dollars of total projects that could be done. We doubled it to sixty. And the Build Act, I had a lot to do with drafting the Build Act, but I had nothing to do with the acronym. So the, the acronym is let's see, better utilization of of investment leading to uh, development. B E Y L D. There you go. So somebody stayed up late one night to think that. But that's that's where the bill that comes from. And that, those are the tools. Now we had it. We had a, a sponsor from the far right and a sponsor from the far left. We had all these people in between. It was extremely bipartisan, which made it such a pleasure to work on. Uh, and uh, you know, ultimately the administration supported it, and it happened. We got it. I was last time I spoke to this group. It was about a month before it passed. So it passed in October of 2018. And uh, one last thing. In the Act, and I had nothing to do with this part of it, there was a provision for the appointment of a development advisory council of outside development experts 
to look over the shoulder of the agency and report to the board. Um, are you on the fairway or are you off the fairway? The board is chaired by the Secretary of State. And the second person on it is the Treasury Secretary and the Commerce Secretary and the head of USAID. And then there's four people who are, who are civilians. So, or outside, the private sector. It called for the creation of this development advisory council. So I ended up getting appointed to that council as chair. So that's that's my involvement. So that's I'm in it day and day. Which is great. And if any of you have questions, my colleagues have uh, those question cards. They'll pass around and you know, feel free to throw pretty much anything at, at, at Rob, <laughs> except for some you know, hardcore sanctions question. Uh, but uh, but just joking. But maybe to um, kind of help people understand it, just at a, at a you know regular level. Yeah, down to earth level. Can you maybe give one or two what you think are strong examples of a success story from OPIC or DFC or projects we're working on now? Yeah, I, um, again, back when I was uh, at the agency, uh, our policy toward the U.S. policy towards Israel and Palestine was the so called two state solution. In other words, we wanted to help create a state of Palestine and to live side by side peacefully with the state of Israel. Well, Israel is an economic powerhouse. Palestine is an economic basket case. And so the instruction we got, and Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State, and she said in no uncertain terms, we have to work on this. We need to try and build the economy in the West Bank and in Gaza. But Gaza sort of wrote themselves off because they, uh, they had an election and, and uh, Hamas won the election terrorist organization, so they were sort of off the table. But anyway, so to help the West Bank grow, uh, we developed a small and medium-sized loan program. It was a $230 million program, and OPIC put in $130 million, and we recruited local banks, meaning Palestinian, Jordanian, and others, to provide the rest. $230 million, that's a lot of money in a place like the West Bank of Palestine. And I was really, really proud to have done that. And what made me even prouder was about four years later, I ran into some of my uh, Palestinian friends who had been involved in it. He said, yep, this was such a great success. We've gone back to OPEC and asked for a second tranche. So, you know, and, um, and it was 70-30 OPEC to the local banks. They said, we have enough confidence that we can go 50-50. So that's a great success story, and it's one that um, makes me very proud. That's great. Um, and we discussed it, but um, we talked about the IMF, we talked about the World Bank. Um, can you discuss the, the need and the importance of engaging our the nations that are our allies, or democratic allies, or the, you know, Japan, South Korea, the Europeans, Canada, but also the, the importance to still work with and kind of support the the major global international uh, uh, finance organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. Yeah, so, I mean, even with all the new tools and the additional authority and additional funding that the Development Finance Corporation has gotten from Congress, nevertheless, we don't have a prayer of keeping up with the Chinese in terms of breadth or <coughs> volume or money. We don't have to compete with them dollar for dollar, we can't. But we need more resources brought to this game than we have simply through the Development Finance Corporation of the U.S. government. So we need to build collaboratives with allied financial institutions, multilateral development banks. In this hemisphere, or in, in Latin America, it would be the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, in Africa, it would be the African Development Bank, same in Asia and then the IFC, International Finance Corporation, the World Bank. And we have to team up together, we have to collaborate together, we have to work on project development and project kind of pipeline. Um, and you know, we're not gonna, it, it won't work to go out and say, we're the anti-China thing. Because a lot of countries have relationships with China. In fact, there are over 130 countries that have signed MOUs with China on their Belt and Road program. That doesn't mean they're doing anything with them, but they've signed MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding with them. So, you know, they these people don't want to just sort of gratuitously poke the Chinese in the eye unless they have to. And so you don't go out and say, this is the anti-China program, sign up right here. So it's rather, 
This is our, you know, Western market-driven economic growth and opportunity program. And we do that by, again, pooling resources and pooling our, our influence uh, on our different continents. So, you know, if I had a, a program between the DFC and the Inter-American Development Bank, and we do, and I had something to do with it, we could go to governments in Latin America and say, we're prepared to underwrite XYZ projects, but we'd like to ask you to play by a certain set of rules. And those rules will be rules that will minimize the rent seeking or the potential for corruption, and rules that will involve uh, abiding by contracts, not just from the beginning when you have the signing ceremony, but through execution to commercial operation. That's what we want. That's what we can do. Um, Andrew has a, a good question, kind of in, in line with what you're discussing before. Um, he says, going back to OPIC, are there uh, examples of uh, countries where uh, our projects have uh, helped improve governments and the rule of law over time? Yes, I'd say many. Uh, and uh, I think um, there, uh, again, I mean, many of the countries where we really help. Uh, are post-conflict situations. So, um, and in, in some post-conflict situations, you know, Liberia, for instance. Liberia is on the west coast of Africa. We have a long-term historic relationship with Liberia that goes back to the whole slave situation. Um, it had just a horrible uh, civil war going on, run by this guy, William Taylor, and a uh, group of thugs, and, you know, they just totally destroyed the country, destroyed the institutions, stripped all the economic assets they had, which were very uh, prolific rubber capacity, destroyed the country. Anyway, they finally arrested the guy. They, with our, with U.S. help, they built a government, and we helped them do that. They had an election uh, and elected their first president, elected the first woman president, of any sovereign country on uh, on the African sub-Saharan African uh, continent, a woman named Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and uh, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is actually now a member of my development advisory council. So um, she's an example of where we help reinforce democratic institutions, and that's happened in a number of places around the world. And we use our leverage to try to push people. To do the right thing. Now, if you'll indulge me, people ask me, did you ever go to Ukraine while I was there? And, I, and the answer was, no, I didn't, and here's why. When I arrived at OPEC, um, there had been a contract with a New Jersey firm to take Warsaw packed shell casings from artillery shells and turn them into sheet metal and sell them. This was a $35 million contract, and for some reason these guys bought $17 million of insurance. Uh, and it, it becomes relevant because the Ukrainian military at that time, which was much more pro-Soviet, as was most of the Ukrainian government back then, much more pro-Soviet, I mean, it's pro-Russian, um, you know, they, they didn't want an American company to be profiting from their old armament. So they took the contract away from these guys. I mean, they just totally expropriated it. So what happened was OPEC then does what it normally does uh, when you have an insurance claim. We say, okay, they claim it was an expropriation. We go and investigate it. Was it an expropriation? Yes. Pay them the money. We paid them $17 million. Then the agency goes after the host government that stole this contract from us to recover the money. And they've recovered historically over 90% of the claims we pay from sovereign government. Sometimes it takes several years. So we had this $17 million outstanding debt from the Ukrainians. I met with three separate presidents of Ukraine. And the reason I met with them was because we had $500 million of investment from Americans, legitimate investment, that wanted to go into Ukraine. And I said, fine, but not until they pay us the $17 million. And so... Every one of these presidents, and I met with all three of them in the United States uh, at different times, you know, I go through the $500 million and say, these are real deals. And then I say, $17 million, $500 million, it's not close. I don't but they could never deliver the deal. Well, finally, you're going to have Bill Taylor, our ambassador to Ukraine, come speak to you 
uh, I don't know, in a couple weeks, a month, um, you, should, <laughs> you should ask Bill about the OPIC debt because he called me to say, we finally got it settled. That was after I left office. And I said, how much did you get from it? I think it was like seven million or something. But that's, that's kind of an example where we're trying to push a country to honor its contractual obligations. And uh, we didn't succeed in the short term. Um, I'm turning to, to a different part of the world, I'm just going to combine two questions uh, for the sake of time. Walter asks, can you talk about China's involvement uh, in Venezuela? Uh, and then kind of, you know, again, in terms of Latin America, Gary Michael asks, what is the U.S. doing to increase investment, uh, you know, and our, our business uh, presence in Central America? Okay, Venezuela, you know, the, the um, Chinese finance and I, I don't know exactly what the number is, but it's somewhere between 20 and $60 billion of Venezuelan uh, debt. And, um, and so, you know, if there's one country on earth that has more invested in Venezuela from a financial standpoint, uh, it's China. Now, more recently, the Russians have shown up for the singular purpose of they look for every opportunity where they can just create trouble, particularly for us. So, you know, they took advantage of the fact that Maduro has zero friends outside of the group that's living off of drug money in Venezuela. Um, they have zero friends outside of there. And, and so, um, you know, the Russians have befriended them and probably helped them find uh, some markets for some of their oil. So, um, I'd say uh, China is not going to get repaid much, if, certainly not all, but I'd say much of what they're owed. Uh, and so uh, that's just money down the drain. Um, Central America, um, I'm working with a group uh, in Washington on how we look at Central America as a real opportunity for nearshoring, bringing back uh, supply chain stuff from China, from Asia, from distant shores into establishing a lot more nearshoring capacity in Central America because beyond the whole tragedy of drugs is the lack of economic opportunity. And so people who are a lot smarter than me about this at Texas a and actually <coughs> there's an Mossbacher Institute on trade and uh, economics and public policy at Texas A&M that was created by Bush 41 and, and named after our father. Um, and um, who was involved in NAFTA commerce. Um, and so, you know, there's a high degree of interest in Texas a and of helping kind of research how do we uh, strengthen nearshoring opportunities. I'll just say, we've talked at some length to Walmart. Walmart employs over, uh, I think, 130,000 people through Central America. And uh, they will stay in Central America if we can start to digitize certain transactions so that they don't get bled to death by corruption. What does that mean? You can digitize permitting. You go online, do it online. You don't you're not have to pay somebody off. So you can do permitting. You can do title work online. You can do tax payments online. This is what Walmart is working on to bring to Central America to take the constant threat of rent seeking or bribery out of the process, which makes most businesses want to pull their hair out and leave if all they're ever doing is paying people off or being told to pay people off. So, and they don't because we have, we have laws against that. But yeah, that's um, sort of the opportunity for Central America. And just because we're uh, just about out of time, but one uh, last uh, you know, interesting audience question. It's a, a little bit specific, but you have, you have the energy background and the, the global finance background. And Bob asks, will China take over Russia's Sakhalin 1 and 2 and Yamal uh, projects since Russia you know, can't operate them? Um, that is a possibility. Uh, you know, actually, I was in a meeting a couple of days ago, a board meeting of an energy company I'm on the board of, and uh, somebody who said, you know, you can buy a substantial part of Rosneft right now on the cheap. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, who in the world would want to own it? But, uh, but China might actually, uh, that might be a, a fairly clever move on their part. Big brother getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lastly, just a conclusion, Rob, what would you like the audience, you know, here and at home, 
um, to take away with really the importance of, of American soft power, the importance of positive influential power, economic power, you know, economic modeling our systems, and, and you know, really what you've done with the Build Act and, and development finance. Well, you know, I, I think over the last several decades, we've gone from a world in which your influence was based upon how many battleships you have, how many tanks you have, how many soldiers you have, to more akin to what values do you stand for and what can you do to help us move out of poverty into economic hope and opportunity. And, you know, even with all the challenges we have, we still have the market cornered on the best economic system, the best economic approach, and, um, you know, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship are all things that every country I've ever been to long to have. And so what we need is a more organized, effective way of projecting that. That means don't leave the field wide open to China and China alone. But to project that, lead with that, not to give people money, but to help them generate wealth, earn money, and build sound economic systems that provide the kind of benefits that we've all enjoyed. So I think we're headed in that direction. I think it requires collaboration among all the like-minded, you know, allied partner institutions and countries, but I'm optimistic we can get there. And I think part of the way we're going to get there faster is by understanding that there are evil forces out there trying to push us in one direction or push the world in one direction. And then there are those of us who are trying to protect freedom and opportunity, and that's, uh, that's where I want to be. Yeah. Well, well, Rob, you know, not just thank you for today, but really thank you for your, your years and years of service to the country, and really, like you mentioned, to kind of just this ideological struggle of, of, of open markets uh, and state-controlled economies, and really just, you know, open liberal democratic systems versus, you know, uh, authoritarianism. Thank you very much, and, and we're delighted to have you, and I look forward to having you again.